Um, greetings and welcome. My name is Michael Le Chevalier. I'm Associate Director of the Lumen Christi Institute. Um, I'm excited to have each of you participating in this series uh, that we are hosting here. Um, we, uh, I'm Associate Director of the Lumen Christi Institute. If you're unfamiliar with us, we are a lay-led organization um, that was founded in 1997 by Catholic scholars at the University of Chicago. And um, uh, our mission is to make the Catholic intellectual tradition and broader Christian tradition a vital part of the university and our broader society through courses, lectures, summer seminars, and web events like these. Um, we are committed to presenting the breadth and depth of the Catholic intellectual tradition and thus are excited to be hosting this series highlighting scholarship of those who work within the Eastern Christian tradition. Um, I'd invite you to tune in again next week at 7 p.m. for uh, the continuation of this series. Now, I'm grateful to the many co-sponsors who have helped make this series a success thus far. This series is co-presented with the Godbearer Institute and co-sponsored by the Beatrice Institute, the Calvert House Catholic Center, the Catholic Theological Union, the Institute for Faith and Culture, God With Us Online, the Harvard Catholic Forum, the Nova Forum, the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University, the St. Benedict Institute, the Sheptisky Institute, the St. Paul University Catholic Center, the St. Stephen, um, St. Stephen Byzantine Catholic Church, and the Tabor Life Institute. Um, you too can actually help play a role in supporting us and making these events a success. Many of you at the conclusion of these events take our surveys and indicate that you would recommend this an event to a friend. Well, after tonight's event, I invite you to do so. Um, not only will you receive an email tomorrow that will give you the YouTube link so that you could recommend this event actually by sharing it on, but you can also let other people know about this series um, as it continues um, over the next two weeks and then with our conclusion lecture in November. Um, you can also help financially support our work by donating today at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. A gift of any kind will help us to continue to present these programs um, for free to broader audiences. Um, let us now turn to today's event to introduce our speaker and moderate our conversation. I'll hand it over to Father Andrew Summerson, co-organizer of this series, priest in the um, Byzantine Catholic Eparchy of Parma, serving St. Mary's Parish in Whitting, Indiana, and patristic scholar in his own right. Father Andrew, I invite you now to unmute yourself and turn on your screen. Thank you very much, Michael. Welcome everybody to our third installment of our webinar series, Eastern Catholic Theology in Action. Thank all of you that's been following us along the whole time. We also welcome all of you who are joining us in Medius Race. Uh, and really at the heart of this is what we want to explain today is the distinctiveness of the Eastern Christian theological tradition, which opens us up to so many worlds. Uh, one world that we might not be familiar with is the competence of our speaker today, uh, Dr. Robin Darling Young. Uh, a patristic scholar and is now associate professor of spirituality at the Catholic University of America. She has published and lectured widely on topics in the history of early Christianity and its thought, including the areas of scriptural interpretation, the history of asceticism and monastic thought, and the Christian cultures of ancient Syria and Armenia. Professor Darling Young is currently preparing an annotated translation of the letters of Evagrius of Pontus and the surviving Syriac translation for the Fathers of the Church series at CUA Press, as well as directing a translation team that will produce English translations from the Greek text and Syriac translations of the same author's Gnostic trilogy for Oxford University Press. She is also the current president of the North American Patristic Society. Uh, I invite you to welcome Dr. Robin Darling Young, who's going to speak to us about a title uh, Christ, the lover of mankind, the lover of humanity, Philanthropos Chelovicoliubets, which is a title that we don't say casually in the Byzantine tradition. We say it 
uh, and pairs, prayers public and private from baptism to funerals. And to show us the horizon of patristic interpretation, Christ, the lover of humankind, philanthropia, mystery, martyria, and Eastern Christianity, we'll now invite Dr. Robin Darling Young to unmute herself and share and to open her screen. Thank you. Good evening. Um, shall, shall I, I suppose I shall begin, Andrew. <laughs> um, well, um, I'd like to say to hello to all of you whom regrettably I can't see, but, um, uh, but I'm very glad that you have decided to attend this lecture um, under these odd circumstances. Um, and with that, I shall begin. My lecture began actually while I was thinking about what to write for a festrift. Um, that's appropriate because a festrift is a celebratory volume. Um, and, um, I, and this festrift what is in fact in the honor of an Eastern Christian priest and scholar. And so I was asked to write an essay reflecting upon Eastern Christianity from the point of a Roman Catholic, which I am familiar with some of the writings and the worship of its various communities, particularly in the period of early Christianity that is the subject of my scholarship and teaching. Um, my interest in this entire topic of Eastern Christianity, uh, not just in, its, in the period of its historical formation, which is my scholarly um, uh, concentration, but also up through the present, really began with an insight that dawned on me when I was a graduate student in Chicago and happened to go to a ceremony uh, at St. Nicholas in Chicago's Ukrainian village on Holy Saturday in 1978. This uh, was a ceremony that is not strictly liturgical, I think, but occurs in between liturgical ceremonies, namely, the veneration of the tomb of Christ and particularly the shroud. I recognize this right away from its rejection by the English reformers uh, who were uh, something of my you know, spiritual forebears uh, as the practice of creeping to the cross. Later uh, from a Greek Orthodox student of mine at Catholic University, I learned of the practice among Eastern Orthodox with a, a burial, being buried with a replica of the shroud touched if possible to the holy places in Jerusalem. The shroud that wrapped the believer in Christ's death, just as the believer had been wrapped in, wrapped in Christ's death and resurrection in baptism. Now on this shroud, and I have one, is, is the Good Friday hymn, the noble Joseph took down your most pure body from the cross and anointing it with fragrant spices, he wrapped it in a clean linen and put it in a new tomb. So powerful is this moment of divine abjection for the benefit of human beings that that action that we know as philanthropia concentrated in the life of Christ that it generated this devotion to, to Christ's abjection. In the 19th century, another point of devotion in the very church of the Anastasis in the Holy Sepulchre. Namely, if some of you have been there, the stone of anointing that greets all those who enter the church through what are now the main doors of the church of the Anastasis or Holy Sepulchre to Westerners. Now, not until later, uh, long after that Holy Saturday in 1978, and long after uh, my exposure to Eastern liturgies in the West, and then through travel in the Middle East itself, did it become evident to me, apparently fairly slow at picking this up, that this abjection or divine contraction, divine identification with human weakness and suffering was signaled in the term philanthropia. The term philanthropia um, translated as uh, love of mankind or love of humanity, of course, encompasses more than that. 
Uh, and it's the first term that I want to explore today because it always strikes me when I attend Eastern Orthodox liturgies, how prominent this term is. Um, so first to turn to philanthropia, and then I'm just going to begin by citing the prayer of the priest at the great litany of the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. And it goes like this. And I think it's important for two themes that we're looking at tonight. Lord our God, whose power is beyond comparison, whose glory is beyond comprehension, whose mercy is beyond measure, and whose love for mankind is beyond expression. In the kindness of your heart, O Master, look upon us and upon this holy church and bestow on us and those praying with us the riches of your mercy and compassion. This prayer has two interesting parts because the first four, the first four statements, power beyond comparison, glory beyond comprehension, mercy beyond measure, and love beyond expression, all point to the, the, what is called the apophatic or inexpressible truth of certainly of philanthropia, but also of theology itself. That is that many things can be attributed to God, can be said of God, but there is a way in which that God and God's attributes and God's very self are simply without comparison, not understandable, immeasurable and inexpressible. This of course is best uh, probably best expressed in early Christianity in the first theological oration of Gregory of Nazianzus, which is easily found, uh, but it rings through the liturgy. And it is the result, uh, its place in the liturgy and its prominence in Eastern Christianity is the result of a very interesting development because we have for for its for its place in christianity we have to look at at least three sources the first source is the de description of social of a social virtue in the ancient world a humane act humanity benevolence praotes even and praotes in greek is really means gentleness um, it's the quality in the social world that is the opposite of thanos, jealousy. Um, so it's a very important term for ethics. Um, it, as a personal quality, it can mean clemency or kindness, courtesy or benefaction. And even in the ancient world, it's sometimes used of animals who are particularly attached to human beings, such as dogs and horses. Aristotle in fact, discusses it in the politics. It is, however, a word that is rare in the New Testament, vanishingly rare. We find it only in the letter to Titus 3, 4, which says, but when the generosity, Christotes, and love of mankind, philanthropia, were manifested of God our Savior, not through works and righteousness which we accomplished, but according to his own mercy, did he save us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit? Interestingly, however, this word has already appeared uh, in the what might be considered the predecessor volume of the Greek New Testament or the Greek works that are eventually canonized into the New Testament. And that is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. Now, this is significant because it gives later Christian writers who are seeking to understand the New Testament as a comprehensive, connected, unanimous, and, um, and philosophical document, it gives them an opening to connect the word to their own cultural world, such that a quality which is appreciated in friends in 
officials, in family members, is also found rooted most explicitly in the actions of God and particularly the actions of God become man, Christ. Now I want to um, just put that down for a minute um, and turn to the next term, which I think it describes both, uh, it describes the liturgy, although the word is the word for mis, the word mysterion is not always used. Other synonyms are used. Um, and here I'm going to cite another liturgical prayer, this one from the Armenian liturgy, uh, in which the term mystery, but not in its Greek form, uh, is, of course, is invoked. And I think this one helps to explain the way in which mysterion is connected with philanthropia. So it goes like this. And again, it's at the beginning of the liturgy. Oh, mystery deep, inscrutable, without beginning. You have decked your supernal realm as a nuptial chain chamber to the light unapproachable and adorned with splendid glory, the ranks of the fiery spirits. With ineffably wondrous the lordly image and clothed him with gracious glory in the paradise of Eden, the place of delights. Through the passion of your holy only begotten, all creation has been renewed and man or humanity has again been made immortal adorned in an indespoilable raiment. Heavenly King, preserve your church unshaken and keep in peace those who worship your name. Now, this is a remarkable prayer and it's very beautiful uh, when sung in the Armenian liturgy. It too points to the apophatic character, the unspeakable character of, uh, of God and of Christ as a manifestation of God, because it is a deep mystery. It cannot be examined. It is without beginning. And, and at the same time, it accomplishes something. This prayer speaks about unapproachable light and glory in a nuptial chamber, a, a very old tradition uh, in Judaism, Ma, uh, uh, that comes up very strongly in the Second Temple Judaism that has so so deeply um, impressed Eastern liturgy and, of course, Eastern theology. Um, Adam has been clothed in glory and will be renewed to glory. Now, mystery, um, meaning a secret, something inscrutable, has had a, a kind of, um, it, 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 it's a word that is sometimes uh, viewed with uh, suspicion perhaps, especially in the West. And, I, and, and although I don't object to the enlightenment, I want to say perhaps the post enlightenment West with its emphasis upon open discourse, uh, which I also um, think is important. Um, but from, from long before the adoption of Greek by the Jewish people and therefore the incorporation of Greek philosophy and long before the composition of the books of the New Testament, the word mysterion has had a very potent meaning. So sometimes it actually means a talisman, some, some object that might have a certain force thanks to its association with divinity. So we find it in the Theotetus of Plato and we find it used as medicine in the works of Galen. Well, this is very interesting because Mysterion actually has this sort of medicinal meaning even as early as Ignatius of Antioch who talks about the great secret hidden from uh, hidden from Satan. In that, he's following the New Testament, where mysterion is a secret re revealed by God. The mysteries of the kingdom of the heavens in Matthew 13, 11. In 1 Corinthians 4, 2, 
mysteries spoken in the spirit, or in Ephesians and Colossians, the mystery of the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians, of course, said in a, said in a, a, a darker way, the mystery of iniquity, but also I think extremely important for the liturgy, it is spoken of in the book of Revelation. Um, the book of Revelation, which I'm told, but I'm not sure of this, others are for free to correct me, um, is not read aloud in um, Eastern Orthodoxy, but that is in church, but it has deeply influenced um, the liturgy. Now, Mysterion appears in the Septuagint, of course, um, as does philanthropia. But it, it's not until the second and third centuries, and there, not in the liturgy, but in certain theologians that, and biblical interpreters, that mystery, the term mystery, begins to gain force, mysterion in Greek, which I should have said is ras in Hebrew, a Persian word. I want finally to touch on the theme of martyria. Um, this is a, a, which translates literally as witness in its broadest and its original sense as testimony admissible in a courtroom. Um, and this is actually a, a, um, a word that is used very early in the composition of uh, the books of the Old Testament, and it appears in the Septuagint uh, to, to, as the word for the covenant cut between Jacob and Laban in Genesis 31, 47. A martyria is a public thing. It seems to be the opposite of a mysterion. Um, but it nonetheless, it also can have a kind of uh, a, a, a kind of mysterious tinge in certain circumstances. Um, and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Now, um, martyria, of course, is the word that in English gives us the much contested term and much disgusted, not disgusted, discussed phenomenon of martyrdom. Um, but martyria is not a state or even a particular set of actions leading to a death. It actually is the, the, the um, personal side, you might say, of the much discussed New Testament term and later uh, uh, in, uh, in later patristic and, and modern theology, the term kerygma or proclamation. Uh, a proclamation though, very public indeed, is only one aspect of martyria. Martyria um, encompasses kerygma, but kerygma does not exhaust martyria. So, it, 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 beginning with this sense of agreement and covenant, covenant in, uh, in the Septuagint, so in Second Temple Judaism, um, it also um, expands, the, the term martyria expands to, to include a sense of agreement and covenant uh, that can mean a righteous and a sacrificial death. It goes on to um, sort of recoup its early meaning when it is a term applied to the shrines of martyrs. So a martyria as something constructed out of rocks is still a testimony, but in this sense, it's a tangible testimony and a recollection of an action which itself is a recollection and a repetition of an action. And it, also is used of uh, it, in the Syriac world, it is used in its Syriac form, Sachdusa, as 
the witness given by Christians in their uh, converse with God or in their worship. And so you can find it in Ephraim the Syrian, whom I believe uh, was discussed earlier in this series. Now, what does Martyria or Sakdutha, or just to be complete, the Armenian Vakayutun, have to do with the larger scene, which is unseen, two, two different uh, words there. Um, it refers to the divine dikasterion, that is the court or the judgment seat of God. Also, I might add, alluded to in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. And I think it's appropriate to mention uh, the way in which the liturgies of the East also recall, even if they do not quote, but since I'm not a liturgist, I can't, um, I can't claim that they never quote this, test, this uh, passage, the book of Revelation, where in Revelation 1-2 and Revelation 1-9, Jesus testifies to himself, or later is testified by witnesses and prophets who enunciate the martyria to Jesu, the witness of Jesus. And those can be found in Revelation 6, 9 and 12, 17. But of course, look, that is a book which looks back to earlier revelations, um, especially the book of Daniel, and claims prophetic and ceremonial uh, witness for uh, the supreme martyria, the martyria of Jesus himself. Now, this last is obviously not a feature only of Eastern Christianity, but when it is understood in its ancient Christian and Platonic and Hellenistic sense, where it is a Hellenistic Jewish sense, where it is not only death, but also testimony in a courtroom, whether civic or imperial or it is or cosmic, it is not hard to see that the term also has liturgical connotations. And in fact, one of, the, one of the places that you can see this most beautifully in early Christianity is in the, is in the writing entitled the Martyria to Polycarpu, uh, the, the, usually translated as martyrdom of Polycarp, but really it's the entire witness of Polycarp that's being talked about where Polycarp's death as a witness is also a Eucharistic transformation. Now, I can't, um, I, 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 these are the meanings of three, these three terms that I think are so strongly highlighted in Eastern Christianity and in its liturgy. But I can't uh, stop um, uh, without noting that the infusion of these terms into the Christian tradition and particularly the Eastern Christian tradition um, could not have come about, I think, without the struggles of the second century in Christianity. And these struggles uh, were marked by biblical interpretation as far as we know, usually, perhaps not always, um, taking place in a schoolroom and not in, and, and not in uh, a liturgical space. The Christian tradition, in fact, um, at this point is being defended by the great thinkers of Alexandria, namely Clement and Origen. And only with their defeat, um, even if it was a, 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 only a partial defeat, a temporary defeat, and maybe even you could say a literary defeat, uh, this, the defeat of Platonic dualism, could these terms be secured for early Christianity and for the liturgies that grew out of it? And by defeat of Platonic dualism, I mean the, the response to biblical interpretation and to a point of view that we know best under the term Gnosticism with a capital G, although um, 
Although uh, Irenaeus um, calls it falsely so-called Gnosticism. Uh, and with that, Irenaeus, of course, tries to honor the term gnosis and gnostic costs, knower, no knowledge and knower as true Christian terms. That's a discussion for another day. Uh, but Platonic dualism, uh, the interpretation based in a radical metaphysical dualism, uh, 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 um, radical, sorry, radical metaphysical dualist interpretation of the dialogues of Plato and later Platonism is what, and here I agree with the scholar Simon Petremont, is what causes Christianity to have its first crisis, namely the denial of the identification of God with creation, the human body, and all other bodies and, and uh, the natural world. And that defeat of Platonic dualism was of course carried on by the two thinkers, first by the two thinkers I've mentioned, namely Clement, um, to whom we must uh, attach the Jewish thinker Philo, since Clement, adapt, uh, since Clement adapted so much of his interpretation, um, and, and Origen, and their heirs in the fourth century tradition, both ascetic and public. Um, it's an, it would be another lecture, I'm happy to give it sometime, to talk about how these three terms are discussed by, for instance, Athanasius of Alexandria, or Basil of Caesarea, or Gregory Nazianzen and Gregory of Nyssa, and of course my personal hero, Evagrius of Pontus, in which these examples, which I've highlighted as liturgical themes, are actually personalized and put into action over a long period of time by Christians devoted to those actions. Um, but I think it's, probably sufficient to say now that these three, these three themes represent the way in which certain early Christian thinkers attempting to defeat a severe challenge to the young Christian tradition adopted the Greek philosophical tradition, and indeed not just philosophical, but Greek cultural traditions, um, and for, uh, uh, in a less well-known way, of course, uh, in, in uh, the Syriac speaking realm, traditions of public benefaction, et cetera. Uh, and behind that, of course, also Jewish interpretation. They adopted those traditions and the flowering of those traditions into public ceremony. So there were actually public expressions of philanthropia, of mysterion. Um, even of Martyria. But what the Christian tradition did in its attempt to defeat the greatest challenge to it of this metaphysical and physical for that matter, dualism was to adopt the terms at hand with uh, understanding them through the Old Testament, um, and did that energetically and systematically. Um, and here I want to mention in particular, Origen of Alexandria, who um, used all three terms that I've mentioned, philanthropia, uh, mysterion, and martyria in his Contra Celsum. The Contra Celsum or against Celsus not fighting, uh, not fighting dualists actually, but an earlier Platonic philosopher and claiming, um, claiming these insights for Christianity and for Judaism uh, before that. Now, it's also the case that Origen put these terms to use in his homilies. Um, not only the homilies on Jeremiah, um, 
uh, uh, of which one particular example stands out and happily preserved in Greek, but also in the newly discovered homilies on the Psalms in which they're all extremely prominent and these take place in a liturgical context. It's not hard for me to imagine when I listen to these themes in Eastern liturgy that I am hearing the voice of these Alexandrian theologians who tried so hard to encompass the actions of Christ witnessed in the New Testament encompass them into a pattern of Christian thinking that then is reproduced and becomes paidetic, educational in the liturgy. Thank you. I'm very happy to take questions now. Um, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, just a couple of questions that did come up of a general nature about uh, where can we uh, find this in different traditions. Um, if you want to engage more sources, uh, do you have any uh, sources that you could recommend? Um, do you, uh, is, sources for these particular terms or sources for the sources of the sources? So yeah, for the, or to, for further study and for further engagement, yeah. Yes, well, um, I actually uh, there. I, I actually like. Uh, there's a very good article um, which I forgot to put on the so, uh, on the um, bibliography actually, but it's easily locatable on the web, and that's an article by Dim Dimitrios Konstantelos, who writes um, who writes about later Byzantine use of the term philanthropia. Um, and um, I think that one is a particularly good article. And um, I, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I would try to go over to my other desk and find it, but I would risk not being able to find it. So if anybody wants to, uh, you're free to share my email. And if everyone, anyone wants to email me, I can send it to that person. Um, uh, I think that, um, I think that uh, the, sor the uh, particularly good source is the Encyclopedia of Eastern Christianity that I put on the bibliography, uh, which has these terms. But I would also, I always say go to the encyclopedias first, of course, I would also uh, say the Encyclopedia of Early Christianity uh, produced in Rome probably 30 years ago and available in an English translation. Um, and I would also, if you have the time and patience, I would also look at exegetical homilies uh, which, uh, as I say, predate the liturgy. I, I'm thinking uh, also of some of the homilies of St. John Chrysostom, particularly the homilies on Matthew, um, which draw the connection between these terms and the way in which Christians in their lives are being asked to appropriate, live them, and become them. I mean, the term that I, the term that I didn't use, which is so often used about, um, about uh, uh, Eastern Christianity, particularly to distinguish it from Western Christianity, is um, the term theosis, or, uh, or for lack of a better word, divinization. Um, but I actually think that theosis is a term um, that is a, a little bit later than these terms and founded on them. That is that the early Christian community finds that it's, that it's, um, that its role is to be, it, it, I mean, it discovers this through reflection, of course, is that its role is to be mimetic of the position of Christ. And one of the places, it's a very ignored treatise, but one of the, um, one of the places that you can find this is actually in a, um, in a work of Clement of Alexandria called, Who is the Rich Man Who is Going to be Saved? Yes, it's long as, uh, it's long and discursive as Clement is long and discursive, but it explains how Christians become one body by caring for each other and the body that they become, of course, is the body of Christ. Yeah. 
Very good. Uh, I just note that uh, in your chat function, uh, we have pasted a bibliography prepared by Professor Darling Young that you may refer to for further study. I uh, also invite you at any time if you want to pose a question in the Q&A uh, function in the bottom of the screen, we have those. Uh, but we do have several questions also that uh, we can continue on with. Um, where Matthew Boren asks, first, thank you for presenting, but out of curiosity, since Christ is the lover of humanity and since Mysterion has medicinal connotations, can you maybe speak to the pat patristic tradition that talks about Christ as the healer of humanity? Well, that's why I, that's one reason that I put um, a very famous, um, a very well-known book by Pierre Adot on the bibliography, Philosophy as a Way of Life, because there are, I think there are two ways that early Christians approach, um, uh, approach this matter. Uh, and one is a communal way, of course, um, in which um, the community gathered is reminded as, as is necessary for human beings, is reminded of who they actually are and what they actually must do. And again, you find that in the uh, sermons of St. John Chrysostom that always have a long exegetical portion and then a long portion that you might call hortatory or directive. Um, but I think where, where early Eastern Christianity really works this out, of course, is in, um, is in monastic or ascetic writings. In as much as uh, ascesis or self-discipline is a primary characteristic of Christ, uh, well, certainly with the renunciatory um, uh, uh, connotation of that word, asceticism is an attempt to become Christ. One of the interesting things that you actually find in all of these thinkers, but my, my knowledge of Evagrius is probably the best. Wow. One of the places you, that you find this is in discussions of philia or friendship. Um, now, philia is a word that is obviously connected to philanthropia. Um, and it means love, uh, but it means a, a love that is a love among equals. Well, that's a very interesting idea <laughs> um, because of course um, in, in its classic expression in Aristotle and later in Cicero, Cicero friendship, uh, amicitia in Cicero, philia in uh, Aristotle, friendship has to take place among social equals. But as this notion is changed in early Christianity and particularly changed by origin and the tradition of origin, philia becomes something which characterizes the community more broadly. And that is because, at least in this tradition, not in all parts of the Christian tradition in, in early Christianity or Eastern Christianity, uh, in this section of the tradition, the core human being is a human being, not a male or a female, therefore not in a social hierarchy, but a human being and the human being and a human being with the capacity to be a friend of God. But to be friends, of course, you still have to be like a friend. You have to be like your friend in, other in order to be a friend. And loving friendship requires, first of all, a kind of abasement that, I mean, self-abasement, I should have said, that actually relates to a Christian virtue, which is not a, um, it's not a Greek, Hellenistic or classical Greek virtue, uh, and namely, which is namely tapinosis, or we usually translate it humility. Um, so humility is a characteris characteristic of uh, philia to theo or philia toward God that Christians have to um, have to have if or have to cultivate 
if they want to be like the one who says, come to me because I am meek and humble of heart. Uh, so this new virtue, the virtue of humility, uh, is something that's linked with these three, ver the three qualities, um, actions, if you like, uh, that I've discussed as, as present in the liturgy, um, but that are also personal qualities according to the moral writers of early Christianity who are by the, primarily monks. And you certainly find that in origin, um, but you will also find it in Chrysostom, the Cappadocians, and uh, most of the fourth century thinkers. Yeah, thank you. Uh, moving to a question from Father Jack Custer, who says, in, in the Book of Wisdom, chapter 7, verse 23, philanthropia is an attribute of a disembodied wisdom that becomes embodied in the person of Solomon. And then Paul, the only New Testament author to use the term philanthropia, also identifies Jesus Christ with wisdom in 1 Corinthians. Would you care to discuss the embodiment of philanthropia and Christ, or to say it another way, the particular connection between incarnation and philanthropia? Okay. Um, uh, I, um, my... Well, let me say this. Um, the, um, writers like Clement and Origen took the New Testament, and, and this is something that's, um, no, let me finish my sentence, it's a bad habit. They took the New Testament as agreeing with itself. That is that there is a coherent witness in the New Testament to um, the life of Christ, the life of the community, and the meaning of Christ's appearance, which is, which initiates the new covenant, right? The New Testament. Uh, and um, that, that um, unanimity of the books of the New Testament is something that many people have difficulty with, but if you are going to read early Christian authors, and probably I would venture to say, listen to the liturgy with benefit, you sort of have to take the unanimity of this witness as a given. So probably that there is one mention, one positive and, mention of divine philanthropia in the New Testament allows Christian authors to say, this is what agape means. It means philanthropia. And philanthropia is an action. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's an intention. It's an action. And it is the personal expression of something that is broader, but also appears in uh, Eastern Christianity, early Eastern Christianity, namely oikonomia. Um, the could be translated as dispensation. Its literal meaning is a household arrangement, but oikonomia here understood as the entire household of God, that is creation. Um, and it is that oikonomia, so the broad oversight of God into which philanthropia fits, because that is the action of a God incarnate, of God incarnate, who, um, and then I think if I were thinking like an early Christian interpreter, which I think I might be able to do now after all these years, um, then I would go to the Christ hymn in Philippians and say the expression of philanthropia is humbling oneself. Um, so departing from glory, descending, humbling so that others may uh, rise. Not that a person would, um, would, uh, would have the idea that he or she is a, um, is a, a descended divinity, but that a person would imitate 
that action in order then, if I can skip back to an earlier theme, in order to become a friend, a friend of Christ and a friend of God, um, which is, uh, as, as everyone here knows, on a day-to-day, minute-to-minute um, plane, difficult to achieve. Mm. Yeah. Which, is why, which is why it comes up again and again, why it's repeated in the liturgy. Yeah, that's um, very interesting. The uh, you mentioned martyrdom as Eucharistic. Could you expand on that, somebody, an anonymous attendee? Oh, yes. Um, so, uh, because um, because martyria is um, is primarily a witness, and because the primary witness, liturgically speaking, of the action of Christ is the Eucharist, we actually find Clement of Alexandria, and I have to say this is much overlooked in his writings, we actually find Clement of Alexandria already connecting witness to Eucharist. Well, why? Uh, or what's the, what's the justification of that? Um, well, the martyria of Christ is a self-offering. The Eucharist is a self-offering of Christ, but also behind that and on a more, um, a, 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 on a different scale, so to speak, or a, in a different temporal reality, um, Clement, like every other early Christian author, thinks of Eucharist as the Eucharist as in the sense of um, the liturgical Eucharist as something which, as an action, which is a temporal earthly manifestation of a continuous action that is going on um, at the heavenly altar itself, itself the model for the temple, both temple on earth and temple as church. And, um, and, and therefore, um, and, and therefore, uh, there, there is a kind of unbreakable link. Now you find this in Clement, in Clement you find it not so much in the more, in the best known works, but in his Hippotiposes. And for that, oh, I'm glad somebody asked that question way back because I wanted to, I wanted to say that for that aspect of Clement, I really recommend um, the works by Bogdan Bukur. Um, a series of articles on Clement and the understanding of celestial priesthood, for lack of a better word, excellent. Um, and this too, even though you don't think of Clement as the source of liturgical thinking, yeah. actually he is. And of course, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll then say, and I should really have put this on the bibliography too, sorry, Andrew, um, is that if you want an, a good compendium, of themes in early Eastern Christianity and its predecessor, Second Temple Judaism, just go to the website maintained by Marquette University called Makom, M-A-Q-O-M, uh, for an excellent and I think still expanding collection of articles on this. Um, and uh, yes, I think, I've, I think I've said enough on that point, sorry. Oh, that's no apologies at all. I wanted to bring a question uh, from Mikhail Nadav, who mentions a, a passage in Origen's exhortation on martyrdom. Oh, yes. Yeah, he mentions uh, there that martyrdom of the saints, the martyrdom of the saints, uh, happens for the remissions of other sins. Um, how do you think this would fit into, you know, some of what you're saying tonight? Origin's really interesting on this topic, um, uh, and um, actually, actually, there's a recent dissertation from Florida State, I think, on the use of the term martyria in Origin, and I point, I point you to that. And if uh, uh, if you want to email me, um, I'll, I'll be happy to give you the more exact citation. Um, um, so. So Origen is, is someone who 
was extremely judicious about martyria. Um, it's, it's interesting that Origen himself, Eusebius tells us in book six of the church history, that Origen himself um, prepared people in Alexandria for martyria, for giving public witness in case they were um, arrested and hauled in front of a judge. And in fact, that he witnessed his own students' um, uh, uh, deaths. And we know at the end of his life that Origen, I say we know, that's really pompous, sorry. Uh, the best indications are that Origen himself was um, tortured and did himself also undergo a public witness. Um, and at the same time, it's not usual to think of Origen as, he's not often included, in, I should say, it, as a kind of source for Eucharistic thinking, for, the, for thinking about the Eucharist. But in actuality, Origen has a very broad way of thinking about the Eucharist, which begins with, uh, which begins with the reception of manna in the wilderness and ends or, can, or reaches a high point um, in, uh, um, in his New Testament commentaries. Uh, and, then, um, and then he understands that the Eucharist is a uh, gift, uh, but it's a gift also of logos, of word. Um, and word, is word in a sense, in a sense, um, enriches and is enriched by uh, the actual ceremony about which he does not say much, but he does, after all, um, give some of his homilies in a Eucharistic context. So, uh, so I think that um, he, he's not usually thought of as a sacramental thinker in, in that narrow way, but I, but I think that uh, his understanding of the entire oikonomia of the Lagos mediated through others who are themselves speaking Lagos, capital L Lagos, um, I think that makes him highly Eucharistic. Hmm. Um, speaking of the sacraments, uh, would you, uh, Botros Sadek asks if is, would you make a distinction between mysterion in the Eastern tradition and sacrament as defined by Peter Lombard? Oh, <laughs> uh, Peter Lombard. Um, well, it's been a while. Can somebody remind me what Peter Lombard says? I'd, I'd have to refer myself to Boutros Sadek. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, well, to have more broadly speaking, the, the, the difference between mysterium and sacramentum that, Tertull yes. that Tertullian picks up. Yeah. Uh, well, um, uh, I think this is very, something very interesting, and I'm going to punt on that one because I, I haven't thought about it and I, clearly enough to make, a, to make um, a good response to your question. Um, yes. But um, it's very interesting to, you know, no language reproduces another language. So mysterion and sacramentum are not equivalent words. Uh, uh, and uh, sacramentum overlaps with mysterion, but isn't the same thing as mysterion and doesn't even come from the same sort of place in Latin usage, as far as I understand, as mysterion does, but it probably is the best translation available of, of mysterion. Uh, that is, was the best translation available. And after all, uh, and this is all I can say about Tertullian at this point, is that he was really the last Latin author to know Greek as well as he knew Latin. So, he may have he have may have meant it to be an equivalent. I could think more about it and invite you to email me, and then maybe I can be of more help, which I would like to be. But 
as soon as you men mentioned Peter Lombard, I knew I was out of my depth. Fine, it's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll send your email along to Boutros. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, Father Joseph Matlack, thanks you for, his lec for your lecture. And seems to, uh, wants to suggest that Kyrieleison found often in the Byzantine liturgy, asked, could that itself be a philanthropic phrase and could be linked uh, in some ways maybe to the physical closeness of the emperor? So uh, is this phrase and Christ the Philanthropos linked a natural outgrowth from one another? Yeah. Well, um, well, <sighs> That's a, that's, you know, that we have to go back. Yes, the short, short answer is yes. Um, the dispenser of mercies um, is, could be a civic official, could be a royal official, um, just as the lover of the poor, Philip Tokos, could be the local city council in, you know, in the age in which the New Testament books were being composed. Um, and uh, all that would mean for thinkers, the thinkers that I'm familiar with, uh, well, that would mean one of two things. Um, this term was around a long time before uh, it showed up in Greek and the Greeks basically appropriated something from, uh, something from an earlier culture like the Hebrews, or it means that the Lagos has distributed hints of himself in, uh, in the social world, which is uh, not attached to the two covenants. I don't want to use the S word secular because there is no secular society, um, you know, until very late in human history. But, um, but certainly to say that Alexander the Great is Soter, savior, um, is only to say, as far as the Christian tradition of the East, early East is concerned, is that Alexander the Soter participates at some, from some vast distance in some of the qualities that make the true Soter Christ and God. So, I mean, that's how they think about it. Uh, because after all, the Lagos, who is the word of God, is the origin of language, right? And so by that very means, he leaves traces of himself to be discovered dimly. That's why in, um, in some of the work I, I do uh, for a century, when they want to refer to Plato, they might quote him directly. If they want to compliment him, they will say an ancient sage or our father, the ancient sage, they know that he was on the right track, just as you know a benevolent mayor might be on the right track. And that might even be the influence of the way the Lagos has structured the world. But a sort of direct borrowing, so to speak, not in their minds anyway. Hmm. Hmm. Um, Annie Hunchadan asks, uh, when we, we talk about the rejection, going back to uh, the rejection of the, the shroud creepers, was that the term you used? Oh, uh, creeping to the cross is. Creeping to the cross, yeah, yeah, thank you. That's how the 39 articles of the Reformed Anglican Church describe it. <laughs> yeah, um, so do, do you know um, uh, if that ritual uh, being buried in a shroud uh, how was there a response by simple believers against uh, that uh, that prohibition? Do you know that? You mean the, you mean, the, the shroud creepers? Yeah. Oh, oh, you mean in England when it was? Yeah, in when, England. Yeah, it was in England. Uh, yeah. Well, there I just recommend that you read the stripping of the altars, there you uh, go. Yeah. which um, which uh, uh, describes the kinds of practices. Um, liturgical practices that uh, went on before um, before they were purged in the 16th century. Um, so, that, I mean, that's a wonderful book, and it will give you many answers that you never even to questions you never even thought you had. Um, uh, but that does 
that does um, that does point to an anecdote. Uh, uh, once once I, I used to belong to the um, uh, Eastern Orthodox Roman Catholic dialogue, and I was standing at a ceremony once, an Eastern ceremony with a Roman Catholic priest friend of mine, and I, I said to him, um, why does this seem so familiar? It was kind of, a, you know, I was baiting him, obviously, and he said, um, he said, well, that's because Eastern Christianity has preserved early Christianity, which I thought was a very interesting thing for a Roman Catholic priest to say, but he did. Huh. Huh. Um, we have here, uh, let me find it here. Uh, could you just speak uh, generally about, I mean, it's such a thorny issue, uh, you know, on the one hand, origin, uh, Gregory Nazianza says, is the whetstone of us all, right? Because he is the first, uh, in many ways, systematic theologian. Uh, but he had a really thorny reception history uh, that uh, us in the guild might know about. So mm -hmm. how would you uh, speak to uh, origins at once genius, but uh, his uh, sort of condemnations that happened uh, through history and how we receive him today? Oh, um, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, Origen's teachings are largely preserved um, um, by later teachers who is, some preserve some parts, others preserve other parts. Nobody preserves the whole thing um, because um, I, I Origen was a genius and they don't come along very often. Um, so the kind of work he did uh, is, is hardly repeatable. Um, but, you know, there's a whole history of, of the condemnation of Origen at the end of the fourth century, which resulted in no formal uh, sort of high level condemnation. It was just episodic. And then the final condemnation, so to speak, in 553 under the Emperor Justinian. Um, that's, a, that's been the topic of monographs. And so I can't say that much about it here, but, um, but, uh, but Origen's thought minus some of the things which bothered his critics, and they are a very small number actually, if you compare it to the entire body of his thought, uh, is all over, uh, all over early Christian and Byzantine uh, and even Syriac and Armenian theology because Origen, Origen was read and appreciated by so many generations before, his, before many of his works were destroyed. And one of his major works in which you can find all of his teachings, um, the Contra Celsum was actually too valuable to be destroyed because it was a definitive answer to uh, against a pagan philosopher and not that great a one either uh, from the third century. So actually um, or places in which Origen said, said things which disagree with Nicaea, Constantinople and the ecumen, well disagree with the four ec original ecumenical councils those things tended to be destroyed, but other parts of Origen survived. And um, people who read Origen, like Gregory the Theologian or like Evagrius, um, also preserved his teaching in slightly, slightly modified forms or in an applied form. Um, so it really did become the foundation of Eastern theology. And I doubt there's anyone, I doubt there's anyone who would really deny that, that origin, origin's thinking is the foundation of Eastern Christian theology, even though it's not, it's obviously not the completion of it, not the end of it, but it continues to be, um, it continues to be very, um, very much alive, obviously, because it's in the liturgy, as I've tried to say, but um, it also, origin's thought also travels to the West. How does it travel to the West? Well, there's some of origins thought to be found in Augustine, um, but possibly a, a more 
straightforward source is in John Cassian, whose writings are commanded by Benedict to be read in Benedict, uh, to be read in the monasteries. And then when the Benedictines, uh, um, you know, become, uh, when the Benedictine monastic tradition multiplies, the conferences and collations of John Cassian continue to be read there, and the thought of origin continues to be reproduced in the monastic setting, but not in the dogmatic theological set setting. So, uh, so it's um, uh, so I, I I think it's fair to say that apart from his theory about the resurrection, and apart from his description of the relationship between the son and the father, most of Origen's thought is still foundational. I mean, he didn't develop it alone, of course. He developed it in dialogue. And that's one other thing that I think is really important about the liturgy is that it's a dialogue and that the Eastern liturgy is a dialogue and it continues the tradition of dialogue of early Christianity but before that, even of philosophy. Okay, that's, I get, I, I think, Michael, you're appearing, so I think it's done, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't intend to, to cut you off. That was an accidental oh. push, but uh, <laughs> we are actually at the end of our time. And so I uh, wanna thank you in particular, not only for this great exposition um, into sort of this, these topics, but also for the dialogue that you continued with us after and I think that you've sitted everyone's um, appetite for an origin lecture to come in the future. Um, lots more questions that were coming through there. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And thank you each for tuning in and joining us today. Um, and I would invite you to join us again next week, uh, next week, Thursday, same time, same place at 7 p.m. Um, as we welcome um, Father Alexander Lashuk, uh, for a presentation entitled Eastern Churches, Latin Territories, Ecclesial Catholicity, and the Notion of Diaspora. Um, so uh, uh, a very hot topic and very uh, a great title. So I would invite you um, to come find out more next week. Uh, I'm grateful also once more to our many co-sponsors who have helped make this series possible um, and who have helped ensure its success and invite you to support us as well. Help get word out uh, to your parishes, um, sign up for our mailing list and forward on our emails about this series um, onward to others. Uh, you are participating in many networks that we have not even touched yet. So we'd invite your help. Um, we also would invite you to become a financial supporter today of our work um, by donating today at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. A gift of any kind can go a long way. Um, otherwise, once more, thank you again, Professor Young, for this fantastic lecture. And we look forward to when we can welcome you back to Chicago in the future. Okay, I I'm leaving now, right? <laughs> right. Bye-bye. <laughs>